Absolutely. Okay. That's the point. Okay, score five. So hit that and then tell me go. Thank you for joining the Nature Bats Last YouTube channel for this live stream. I have three announcements I'd like to start with. We are seeking questions for Sam Karana for next month's Nature Bats Last radio show. I've already received a few questions, but I would appreciate a few more. You can send those to me via email. Or you can send them to Pauline via Facebook message. Question that you're not allowed to ask is, who is Sam Karana? And let's listen to the chorus of this song. Daydreams are somebody's lies. Lies ain't no harder than telling the truth. Truth is the perfect disguise. So this is a song from Chris Christopherson released in 1964 called Shandy, otherwise known as The Perfect Disguise. And he says there in the chorus, lies ain't no harder than telling the truth. Truth is the perfect disguise. Sam Coran is disguise, the truth. It's the perfect disguise. So let's not ask who he is. I've heard that question so many times. Okay, second announcement. We'll be interviewing Ken Avador, the artist, for the November Nature Bats Last radio show. Some of his work can be found on YouTube at the channel Bicyclopolis. So it's spelled just like bicycle, except instead of ending with E, it ends with opolis. Just like this, Bicyclopolis. So I just watched this morning a little less than four minutes of video, a very poignant video called A Good Nose, A Good Nose on the Bicyclopolis channel. Pauline, you can turn off the sound now. And very importantly, thank you to Phyllis Perry for the mic stand that we're using for this very live stream. We first met Phyllis and her partner, Kurt, in Western Belize when they were visiting there, and later they hosted us on tour. Final note, Ken Avador, the artist, also has a book out called Roadkill Bill. It came out, it's actually a collection of his cartoons or graphic art, and it came out in 2001. So. I want to be sure to push that. Okay, so the point of today's, well, one of the points of today's live stream is to discuss the paper by Strona and Bradshaw that was published in Scientific Reports. It's called Coextinctions Annihilate Planetary Life During Extreme Environmental Change. So Presumably, at least a few of the people participating in, the li in this live stream read that paper. It's an open access journal. Okay, I'm going to start with the questions as they show up here on YouTube during the live stream. Delana Enzo asks, is it possible for the Earth to explode from methane concentrations released by Siberian tundra? broken gas pipes, after earthquake, etc. Could methane make gas fire on the surface of the earth? Thank you. First of all, thank you for joining Climate Defenders, Delana, and also David Lotz. Thanks for joining as a climate defender. Delana, it's probably not possible. Methane requires about 5% or 5 parts per 100 to be flammable. And it's currently measured in parts per billion it actually barely records in the parts per million category, maybe two parts per million, 2,000 parts per billion. So that's nowhere close to the five parts per hundred that is required for it to be flammable. 
in the air. So let me see. Scrolling through, trying to find questions. Greetings from all over the planet. Thank you, everybody, for joining from all over the planet. Ask Sam if the perpetual rains will help keep the nuclear reactors from eating up the ionosphere. All right. So no questions are screaming in so far. So I will turn to the paper itself, Scientific Reports. In this paper, Strona and Bradshaw, and the peers that reviewed the paper, conclude that a five to six degree Celsius global average temperature rise will be sufficient to destroy all life on Earth. And I've been, oddly enough, I've been receiving a lot of backlash since this paper came out because I've been citing it as a legitimate source and people really don't like to think about the annihilation of all life on Earth. Most people don't even like to think about their own death. So as a consequence, people have been pushing me hard, which is weird, for having this paper published. And somebody pointed out that the paper backpedals a bit. And sure enough, if you look on, look in the overview section, which is more than halfway into the paper, one, two, third paragraph, middle of the third paragraph, that would be enough to annihilate all life directly with the possible exception of some extremophile species. Extremophiles are those that are found in extreme conditions, thus the name. And if this is your version of hashtag winning, then I think you're missing the point. There certainly will be no humans around to observe the last remaining extremophiles and probably little or no complex life at all. All life on Earth generally means all life, even including the extremophiles. And they conclude that it might not happen that a few extremophiles might sneak through. Well, I didn't see Strona and Bradshaw cite a couple of papers that I'd like to bring to your attention. Possible, this is in Nature Geoscience by Schneider et al. And it's called Possible Climate Transitions from Breakup of Stratocumulus Decks Under Greenhouse Warming. It was... Hmm, published in 2019, and it led to the 8 degrees Celsius increase in global average temperature that Sam Carana projects in 2026. So originally Carana predicted, sorry, predicts, not projects. Originally Carana predicted that there would be a 10 degrees Celsius global average temperature rise. He made this prediction in the middle of 2016 and said that in 2026, we would be at 10 C above the 1750 baseline. And as a consequence of this paper coming out by Schneider and colleagues in Nature Geoscience, he concludes that instead of there being a 10 degrees C increase, there would be an 18 degrees C increase by the middle of 2026. And that's a result of clouds being torn away from the atmosphere that would trigger a surface warm warming of about 8K globally, 8 Kelvin, which is the same as 8 Celsius, and 10K, or about 10 degrees C, in the subtropics. In addition, there's an and I quoted this paper, I believe, in my Extinction Foretold, Extinction Ignored essay that I was 
more or less constantly updating. And before that, I quoted this paper from Nature Communications by Pop, P-O-P-P, and colleagues. Again, from Nature Communications, titled Transition to a Moist Greenhouse with CO2 and Solar Forcing. I quoted this paper in the Climate Change Summary and Update that has its own tab at the blog, guymcpherson.com. The climate instability, this is, I'm directly reading from the abstract of this paper by Pop and colleagues, published February 9th, 2016 in Nature Communications. The climate instability is caused by positive cloud feedback and leads to a new steady state with global mean sea surface temperatures above 330K. That's about 57 degrees Celsius. 56.85 degrees Celsius. Well, we began the Industrial Revolution about 13.5 degrees Celsius. We're currently sorry, at about 13 and a half degrees Celsius. We're currently at about 15 and a half degrees Celsius. So you can imagine a global average temperature rise to 57 degrees Celsius would be very inconvenient for life on Earth, actually, for all life on Earth, including extremophiles. That's a nice little special effect. I also wanted to point out another interesting piece of artwork that Ken Avador generously sent and that I'll be using for the rest of the show today. I'm just going to hold this right here, answer your questions. I love how this shirt is gray. How did he know? It's a, it's a perfect match, <laughs> really. James, John, we have definitely passed the 2C in temperature. From the 1750 baseline, I reported this in a few of the peer-reviewed papers I've had published recently. You can find any of those papers about just below any recent posts on the blog. So you go to guymcpherson.com and scroll down to just below. I think there's one other announcement before it. Then I have a list of my recent peer-reviewed papers and a few of those quote the above 2C or when we pass the 2C temperature rise above the 1750 baseline. Mm. So yes, we have passed the 2C baseline. And by the way, 2C was never a reasonable target. That was the one proposed in 1977 by an economist of all people, William Nordhaus, the United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases in October of 1990 said that 1C was the upper limit beyond which we would trigger self-reinforcing feedback loops. And William Spratt, climate science writer and speaker, concluded that it was probably half a degree, not one degree, when we started triggering those self-reinforcing feedback loops. And that was you know, sometime in 2014. Again, all of this information is included at the long and frequently updated essay, Climate Change Summary and up, Update at GuyMcPherson.com. So we've long known that 2 degrees C was ridiculous, and yet the United Nations IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, keeps trotting it out there as if it matters. It never did, despite what a, an economist concluded in 1977. And so we're long past thinking that would be the point at which we could not return to abrupt irreversible climate change. Now we're beyond two. Joey asks, is the severe heat wave out west that is to be followed by a cold front on Tuesday a direct result of the lack of Arctic ice? I don't know. I haven't seen anybody connect those particular dots. It wouldn't surprise me because the lack of Arctic ice leading eventually and probably in the very near term to no Arctic ice is associated with even crazier temperature swings than we've seen previously. So it wouldn't surprise me if there was a link between the declining Arctic ice 
volume and extent and the mm, rapidly changing weather patterns that we are observing. But I haven't seen any peer-reviewed articles that address that topic. Are you expecting a false flag or a war to distract people in the U.S. from the current president stealing the election? At this point, it would be very difficult to surprise me with anything. A false flag? Well, we only had, what, half a dozen of those under the previous president, who was supposed to be one of the good guys, or so I heard. Very little would surprise me with respect to the current administration. Will we have a false flag? I don't know. I'm a little surprised we haven't had anywhere close to the kind of overt military activities that we saw with the previous president. But give him time. Do you foresee empty grocery stores by late 2020, early 2021? Well, it certainly wouldn't surprise me. But on the other hand, I'm surprised we made it this long without that happening. So maybe I'm not a particularly reliable source on that particular topic. I've been living as if time is short for a very long time, or what seems like a very long time to me. Of course, from the perspective of the cosmos, it's almost no time at all. From the perspective of an individual human being, a few minutes, a few days seems like a very long time, particularly depending upon the conditions that you're exposed to during that time period. Don asks, do you agree that a major tenet of ecology is that everything is connected, the web of life isn't just poetic? Our hubris seems to resist that. Yeah. I would say that a major tenet of environmental studies is that everything is connected. Ecology is the study of something. So, and this is, this is a frequent misunderstanding that people have that ecology and environment are the same thing. They're not. Ecology is a focus of study or the, the study of a particular set of interactions. So if we're talking about environment, I agree that a major tenet of environmental studies is that the web of life isn't just poetic. The web of life is not something that just appears in films. There is a series of interactions between organisms that are very important. And this was the focus of the paper by Strona and Bradshaw from November 2018 in Scientific Reports, that the interactions between species will trigger additional species extinctions as a result of one or a few species going extinct or even being dramatically reduced in number. So it doesn't take an extinction event, as they say, it doesn't take an extinction of a species to cause other species to go extinct. It just causes a significant decline in the numbers of various species. And this is particularly evident and reported in the literature, as they indicate, with species that are called keystone species. So once a particular species disappears, it's likely to take a few or many other species with it. And that's because it is a seriously interconnected body of organisms that are out there in the world. And they have co-evolved Thus, the idea of co-extensions, of course, if these species co-evolved, co if they evolved together, then we would expect that as one goes extinct, another one or, or a dozen or thousands might go extinct as well. And that's because of this co-evolution and a con as one consequence, co-extinctions. So I once explained to somebody that the difficulty in using the idea of unraveling is that you can pull a thread from your sweater 
you know, you see that loose thread and you pull it out and nothing happens. You just get rid of that thread. It was annoying the way it was sticking out there to begin with. And you can do that for any number of threads. At some point, you pull a thread and the whole sweater falls apart. Or maybe just the sleeve comes off the first time. And that's a sort of similar situation that we face in light of co-extinctions. I'm actually surprised it took so long for a paper such as this one to appear. People have been focused on ecological research, modeling, field research, laboratory research for more than 100 years. And it takes until 2018 before somebody puts together these seemingly obvious connections that with coevolution comes the idea of coextinction. That as one species goes extinct, of course other species will go extinct because we alone depend upon many thousands, perhaps millions of species for our own existence. So does every other species out there. So it shouldn't come as a big surprise that when a species disappears, it takes other species with it. Michelle, you're right. We sold our rice surplus to China, and China is losing their corn crop. We also sold a whole bunch of our corn to China. Smoke if you smoke them if you got them. Yeah, I don't think that expression has applied better than it does today. I'm frequently criticized, and probably justifiably so, because I have incorrectly predicted the demise of this set of living arrangements a few times. It seems like more than a few when you when you see the list on somebody's post that is about me. But in any, any event, I guarantee that we've never been closer to the end. As individuals, as a species, we've never been closer to the end than we are right now. And smoking, if you've got them, seems like a fine idea to me. And I don't even smoke. Although I did once, for the first time since I was six years old, in that episode with Bill Nye for National Geographic Explorer, and that was, I don't remember what year that was, 2015, I think. September 10th, 2015. And I remember thinking, I've been missing out since I was six years old. I was 55, and the last time I'd smoked was when I was six or something like that, when my dad stuck a cigarette in my mouth to confuse all of his children that... To, to point out to all of his children that they shouldn't smoke. And of course, it had the anticipated response. It turned us all green, and we're coughing and choking and thinking we're going to die. And that's because my dad smoked three packs a day for pretty much his whole life from the time he was 15 or 16 years old. So he recognized it as a bad idea. So I didn't smoke for something like 49 years. And then I smoked some camel wides with Bill Nye in front of the camera. And I thought, this is awesome. These are great. I felt like I'd been missing out for 40 some years and I wanted to go rerun that whole thing and start smoking again. Anyway, it's probably not, I probably shouldn't be advertising cigarette smoking, <laughs> but it was great for me. <laughs> Marine asks, does warmer climate mean more rain or just more humidity in the air and heat? Yes, all of the above. If there's more moisture in the air, more humidity in the air, that moisture has got to come out. And that coming out depends upon a wide variety of atmospheric conditions, but it's got to come out. The atmosphere can only hold so much moisture in it. And as a consequence, there's been an expression for many, many years, for several decades, that a warmer climate is a wetter climate. A warmer planet is a wetter planet. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing more and longer lasting rainfall events than we've ever seen before. Because a warm atmosphere holds more moisture than a cold atmosphere. And it might not seem like a lot, but... A uh, two degree Celsius global average temperature rise means some places warmed up quite a bit more than that, most notably in the tropics and subtropics. And once that moisture in the is in the atmosphere, it has to come out at some point, and it comes out in the form of rain or rarely snow. So, yes, 
a warmer climate means more rain and more humidity in the air and more heat, obviously. Are there any new tipping points that have come to your attention lately? Something maybe you didn't see coming? Global dimming, dimming is something I didn't see coming until you pointed out. Yeah, global dimming was something that I didn't see coming either. And as I indicated in one of my articles in, what was that journal called? The, the clinic, clinical, clinical Psychology Forum. That's right. Clinical Psychology Forum, I pointed out, the paper is called Going Halfway, and then there's some subtitle. And I indicate that there's a reason you won't, weren't told and I wasn't told. This is, this is, in my opinion, the most important facet of climate change is global dimming or the aerosol masking effects. It's the most important element, and yet I never heard a thing about it until after I'd studied the topic for 35 years. And there have been published papers in the peer-reviewed literature since 1929. And that 1929 paper is mirrored almost exactly by the 2011 paper by Hansen, James Hansen and colleagues. And so the aerosol masking effect was predicted in 2011 by, or, or discovered by Hansen and colleagues in 2011 to be almost exactly the same as what Angstrom discovered. Yes, that's actually his name, Angstrom, in 1929. So that tells me that the point of no return for all of us was more than a century ago. If the aerosol masking effect was approximately the same in 1929 as it was in 2011, which is approximately the same as it was a few years later, it's just that we've become better at measuring the aerosol masking effect. Well, that tells me that we couldn't go back to 1920 in terms of industrial activity and expect that to, to save us somehow. So that tells me that we reached the point of no return before any of us were born, unless you're more than 100 years old, in which case I'm still not going to blame you for the predicament in, in which we find ourselves. So... This goes back a long way, the, the notion and the study of the aerosol masking effect. And that tells me, given the documentation, that the point of no return was a very long time ago. Could all the forest fires burning particulates into the atmosphere offset the loss of global dimming from industrial slowdown? Yes, could be. And in fact, there's a paper I came across recently, I'm not going to be able to come up with the citation for it, indicating that the Roman Empire, especially in the center part of the Roman Empire, the industrial activity from there, which had a lot to do with burning open fires, open wood fires at that time, that it was responsible for a local impact on aerosol masking that, that could be measured in this paper centuries later. So again, this tells me that we have to go back a long time. We have to turn back the clock a long time to get to the point of, quote, no return and also the forest fires putting particulates into the atmosphere can have an impact today. And so they might be partially masking and overcoming the reduction in aerosol masking as a result of reduced industrial activity. So it could be that we're seeing this balancing act playing out. I ain't got too many wires here. This balancing act between reduction in industrial activity causing the aerosol masking effect to decline or global dimming to decline. And so that should cause increased heating. But if there's more fires burning, then that might be compensating for the loss of masking and making it seem sort of normal out there. Although 2020 doesn't seem very normal to me. So a great picture the other day the 2020 keyboard and it showed a standard keyboard for for a computer 
and it just had three keys with anything on them, F, M, and L. That's where we are in 2020. Good question, Charles. Is it not true that the two degree average, all caps on average, global temp is exactly that, average? The mid continents, particularly the Arctic, are above slash well above 2C. Yes, absolutely. The Arctic is far better documented than the Antarctic is, and the Arctic is warming at least three times as fast as the global average. Maybe more, but People who report the data are reluctant to go out on a limb by telling the actual truth. So it's, and, and you don't have to look far to find, even in the corporate media, stories about how warm it is in the Arctic. Recently, temperatures above 100 degrees, that's above the Arctic Circle, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is in the neighborhood of 40 degrees Celsius. So very, very high temperatures in the Arctic that are undoubtedly a result of planetary warming and the temperate regions will catch up. There's no doubt about that. Also, there's the paper I pointed to several times published earlier this year in Science Advances indicating that lethal wet bulb temperatures are being are, are popping up or being documented in tropical and subtropical regions around the globe. And of course, the corporate media papers that came out coincident with that paper being published indicate that this is 80 years ahead of schedule, as if nature has a schedule for us that means 2100 is when we're all supposed to die. So that, it, that the paper was published in 2020 indicating lethal wet bulb temperatures were already playing out in the tropical and subtropical regions all around the planet is pretty bad news. And bear in mind that the Arctic and Antarctic regions are warming up much faster than the equator and s tropical and subtropical regions. People from Extinction Rebellion are protesting and dancing. I hadn't seen the part about dancing. Suddenly I have newfound respect for Extinction Rebellion. But Greta Thunberg, Thunberry went back to school. Do you think that, that they can achieve anything? No. For one thing, Extinction Rebellion is comprised almost completely of liars. Liars who completely ignore the aerosol masking effect. We've had, there's more than two dozen papers in the peer-reviewed literature on the aerosol masking effect. Recently, those papers have received a lot of attention, and I've pointed out several of those papers to the speakers and one of the co-founders of Extinction Rebellion, and they just continue to ignore it. They continue to act as if I'm making the whole thing up. They often look the other way when it comes to the full evidence. So I have very little respect for Extinction Rebellion as a, quote, movement, or for the people who claim to be leading the charge, including the academics in Extinction Rebellion. Greta went back to school. She wasn't achieving anything. She, she was distracting people, just like the Suzuki girl did decades ago. They're, they're great distraction, and I strongly suspect that's why the corporate media paid so much attention to Extinction Rebellion for about six months. But then they disappeared. It was as if they were never even here for more than 20 minutes. And that's what the corporate media does. That's their job, folks. If you haven't figured that all yet out yet, then you're clearly not paying attention to the big picture. The big picture is the corporate media is part of the corporate government. It's part of the show, folks as George Carlin called it. And it's only the, the, the primary product or products from the corporate media are confusion and disinformation. 
not presenting all of the information, presenting little slivers of it, confusing people, having you looking over here when the real action is over here. That's the point of the corporate media. That's why they're called the corporate media. Scott asks, do you think the trend of automated food production, such as growing food in shipping containers, is in response to climate change? Well, yes, the climate has changed. It becomes It is becoming increasingly difficult and in some places essentially impossible to grow food. And there are several places now in the subtropics and tropics where it has become impossible to grow food. This is These are places where people had lived families had lived for generations and had grown food and now they can't grow food there anymore at the same time we're in the midst of abrupt irreversible climate change i think it's not too difficult to connect those dots do i have any insights on the status of environmental education programs in the schools they existed in the 70s yes they did I don't know. I, I don't know what goes on in the public school system. And I know that at colleges and universities, the fragmentation of disciplines was largely complete in the 1970s. And then there was a... Hmm, reintegration of some of those programs. So we saw things like in the 60s and 70s, we saw programs splitting off into biology became botany and zoology. And then more recently, over the course of the last two decades, I'd say, we've seen a reintegration, maybe it's been longer than that, a reintegration of programs so that now we have evolutionary biology programs or ecology and evolutionary biology or just biology for the title that includes those former zoology and botany departments that are now integrated into the same department. But I don't know what's going on in the public school system or schools in general. What I've seen throughout the majority of my life and continuing today is a fragmentation of disciplines and subject areas at the college and university level. And I think that's too bad. It's indicative of the specialization within this and prior civilizations. So the more specialized a person becomes, the more valued he or she becomes. And I think that's going the wrong direction. And that's one of the reasons I didn't fit in particularly well at the handful of universities where I taught was because I was bridging disciplines. I was taking a transdisciplinary approach instead of focusing very narrowly. And as I pointed out many times with a line I stole from somebody that is so long ago I don't remember, the typical approach in academia is to study something more and more and the subject area becomes smaller and smaller until at, toward the end of it you know everything about nothing at all. And that's the typical academic approach is to have, is to reward people who are studying increasingly fine narrow topics of interest and discovering everything about nothing at all. Can you talk about the denaturing of plants a bit, please? Yes, there are proteins in plants and photosynthesis as it transpires is a process of creating these proteins. Photosynthesis leads to a process that allows for proteins to be produced. And when the temperature gets too high at the, in, the, in the area around the plant, then those proteins begin to denature or fall apart. 
So respiration is then exceeding, the rate of respiration is exceeding the rate of photosynthesis. And this occurs, I think I've pointed out the number before, and it's escaping me now, something like 40 degrees C, something in that neighborhood. And so what this means at a, a very simple level is the process of photosynthesis is no longer keeping up with the process of surviving, of respiration, of just breathing and sweating and getting through the day. You can't, the plants are not able to fix enough carbohydrate to keep up with the amount of respiration that they're, that they're causing the photosynthetic products to disappear. So you can go into a lot further details can be a lot more complicated than that, but that'll do for now. Basically, imagine a plant is you, your whole body. If you stop eating, even if you're a breatharian, at some point you're not producing enough material to keep your body mass intact, and so your body mass starts going away, even if you drink water. And at relatively high temperatures, the, kind, the likes of which we're exceeding regularly now in tropical and subtropical regions, at those reasonably high temperatures, the process of photosynthesis cannot keep up with the rate of respiration. The programs are denaturing. The proteins are denaturing. The plants are literally falling apart. That's what the the protein denaturation process is all about. How far above actual ground level is the data for AGT? First of all, you need to tell me what AGT is. Are soil microbiomes hotter than the altitude from which the... Is that average global temperature? Okay, average global temperature is... That must be what it is. How far above actual ground level? The meteorological stations in the United States are boxes painted white that have a thermometer, a max-min thermometer, and a rain gauge in them. And that's, that's the general one. There are more than 15,000 of those scattered around the country. And there are many of them that are far more sophisticated than that, that measure wind speed, for example, at six feet and 20 feet and so on, and do it relatively continuously. And there's the same thing going on with respect to precipitation and also temperature. But those thousands of weather stations around the United States and by extension around the globe, because it's a model that has been copied, copied by other countries, indicates the minimum and maximum temperature for the previous 24 hour period. Depending up, upon where you are, the, the measures are, are supposed to be taken at eight o'clock in the morning. So. 8 o'clock in the morning Eastern Time, 8 o'clock in the morning Central, 8 o'clock in the morning Pacific. Those measurements are taken at the various weather stations. And I used to do this when I worked at a fire station, which had, which was designated an official meteorological station. So I would go out and there'd be a maximum thermometer. You'd see what it had bottomed out at, and then you would drag the, the little device down with a magnet so that the next 24 hours, it would be measuring only within that 24 hour period. And then you'd look at the maximum temperature as well. Those are just a couple of feet off the ground. Are soil microbiomes hotter than the altitude from which average global temperature is measured? So the av average global temperature is a, a collation of all that information from the weather stations. And it gets very complicated in terms of how the data are handled, but basically the stations are only this two and a half or three feet off the ground. Are the soil microbiomes hotter? No, they actually tend to be cooler because a half an inch or an inch of soil, a, a centimeter or two centimeters of soil provides incredible insulative capacity. So you don't have to go down very far in the soil to eliminate variations in above ground temperature on a daily basis. The diurnal changes in temperature no longer matter once you're down there about an inch or so. 
or two and a half centimeters. So the soil microbe, microbiome, the soil ecosystem is more resilient to changes in temperature than is anything above ground. So the action occurs first, the changes are occurring first where we can see them. Are the changes below ground? Absolutely. And particularly when it comes to things like fungi and the intricate relationships between roots of all organisms and fungi, we don't even have a clue. But both of those organisms, the plants and the fungi, have bodies that are at least that are above ground at least part of the time with fungi, pretty much all the time with plants. And so what's going on below ground is relatively poorly studied and is undoubtedly dependent upon what's going on above ground. I strongly suspect that what is experienced or what actually occurs below ground will lag behind what's happening above ground because above ground is where the changes in the environment are happening far more quickly than below ground. Osama says, I heard the men saying something the captains tell they pay you well. And they say they need sailing men to show the way and leave today. Was it you that said how long? How long? Hmm. Speaking of paying well, <laughs> I read just a few days ago that I'm in the upper middle class. So I am not experiencing climate change like poor people are. <laughs> yeah, I haven't been paid for 11 and a half years. I'm in the upper middle class. Apparently the upper middle class has changed quite a bit in the last few years. <laughs> Whew, I wish I was in the upper middle class. It happens. It's been bumped down a few. Times. Yeah. What question are you at now? I'm at Kevin Hester's question. Mm -hmm. First, I'm going to thank Master Pool for joining as a member in Climate Defenders. And Kevin asks, recently there was an orchestrated attack on the great Peter Wadhams and the methane bomb hypothesis. Do you think it was linked to the incessant attacks on you for speaking truth to power? I think there, there has always been, within the time that civilizations have occurred on Earth, and up until the present day, speaking truth to power is generally a bad idea. Speaking truth at all. I mean, there's a reason messengers are killed. And these days they aren't killed so much there as they are destroyed. The ability to get out their message is destroyed. But, but it's pretty much the same thing. Yes, a, a few are still killed. But the deep state, and I'm not a paranoid conspiracy theorist for pointing out that there is such a thing as the deep state. The deep state is far more sophisticated than it was in the 1960s when the deep state killed two Kennedys and a, and a king in less than five years, when the deep state was responsible for the murder of hundreds, perhaps thousands of Black Panthers. The deep state is far more sophisticated today than they were then. Witness the suicide of Michael C. Rupert. They didn't have to kill him. They just made him, had to make his life miserable enough that he would be willing to take his own life. So... There is little need to directly, overtly kill people today for the messages they present. Does that mean there are not other activities that are going on to remove people from service? Of course not. I was a subject of a rather significant deep state campaign to have me removed from service a little over three years ago. And it was completely successful. It was sophisticated and very successful. I've been removed from public service. I was delivering presentations for free. And as a result of people like Corey Morningstar, Derek Jensen, Mike Sleva, Luke Orsborne, the list goes on and on, Carolyn Baker, uh, 
No, I don't get any of those invitations. I'm rarely even asked to submit to an interview in corporate media outlets. And when I am asked, occasionally I'm unasked shortly thereafter because somebody gets a memo. So speaking truth to power has always been a bad idea from the standpoint of the speaker and what happens next in their life. What effects do you expect from current methane levels? You know, it's interesting. I, one of these, one of these papers I mentioned earlier. Mm. Ah, yes, the paper in Nature Geoscience by Schneider and colleagues, published February twenty fifth, twenty nineteen called Possible Climate Transitions from Breakup of Stratocumulus Decks Under Greenhouse Warming. Climate transitions, that's a really interesting and, and mild word for it. And what they predict is when CO2 levels rise above 1,200 parts per million, that will trigger a surface warming of about 8C globally and 10C in the tropics. We're already above 1,200 parts per million carbon dioxide equivalent in the atmosphere. And the equivalent part is important here. And a big part of that equivalent comes from methane. I think last I checked, we were at slightly below 2,000 parts per billion methane in the atmosphere. Let's just assume we're at 1,500, which is too low. So if we're at 1,500 parts per billion, methane in the atmosphere, that translates to 1.5 parts per million. And methane is more than 100 times more powerful a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is, molecule for molecule. So that 1.5 parts per million is really 150 parts per million, if I'm doing the math right. And there's no guarantee of that. And so tack on 150 to the more than 400 parts per million carbon dioxide of the atmosphere, just based on those two greenhouse gases alone, we're at 550 parts per million CO2 equivalent right now. And that's a very conservative estimate based on only 1,500 parts per billion methane in the atmosphere. So... And, and based only on those two greenhouse gases from amongst uh, at least 40 more. So we could be fast approaching that 1,200 parts per million equivalent of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I doubt we're there yet, but it appears that it's not far away. Do you think that all the fresh water on the Arctic Ocean might be a feedback because fresh water will freeze first, thus creating an insulation barrier between the cold air and salt water below? Yes, it might actually be a positive feedback because as it freezes, it increases albedo or reflectance so that relatively saline water lacking salt in it will freeze faster and therefore allow for greater reflectance. So that might serve as a positive feedback. However, bear in mind that that ice layer is going to be very thin. So the water coming off Greenland, for example, and Alaska and Northern Canada and Siberia that water is going to mix relatively quickly with the salt water in the ocean and it's not going to be around long even if it grows to an inch or two thick it doesn't take much to cause the melting and the breakup you know the next significant storm in those kinds of conditions might remove all of that ice so yes it might well serve as a positive as as a, I don't want to confuse terms, it might well serve as a feedback that increases albedo and therefore slows the ongoing rapid climate change. But that's counting on a lot of hmm, 
information that I don't think we have full access to, as well as the a, a stable ice mass at the surface that might actually not be very stable. Do you see society going towards the end, chaos or ordered? Will there be a critical mass moment or will the masses just wonder why the price of food keeps going up? <laughs> That's a great question. You know, I, I frequently read or hear that the outcome has got to be chaotic, that chaos will break out, that people will kill their neighbor for a can of peaches. And don't get me wrong, I'm a huge fan of cans of peaches. And, but, I, but there's no guarantee that that will be the case. We have seen throughout history moments of extreme duress at the level of communities, maybe even at the level of society. And the response throughout history has been the same. Some people respond and become even worse actors than they were before. Some terrible people become even more terrible as a result of chaotic conditions. And some people don't. Some people become kinder, more compassionate, more willing to serve than even they were before. What kind of person are you? What kind of person will you become? You've had the warning. A lot of people have not had any warning. And that's one of the outcomes of my being removed from public service is we have fewer people informed now than we would have had. And that's by design, obviously. But you have the opportunity to the extent that you have free will, to the extent any of us have a significant measure of free will, you have the ability to take actions that reflect well on you and on our species as we spiral into the end. How are you going to act? If a significant number of people act like you act, and that's positive, and act like I act, and that's positive, then perhaps it won't be as horrible as I constantly read and hear that it's going to be. I, I, I don't even imagine that it'll be science fiction-like where everybody just goes to sleep at night and doesn't wake up the next day. But on the other hand, I know it can be better than the worst that I see. And I know that based on the actions of many people throughout history. I'm not going to get into any arguments about 9-11 and, and the, the source of the damage, but there were first responders that ran into the buildings. They ran into the buildings that were collapsing. That's all I need to know about how certain human beings respond in the face of an emergency. Will you be one of those people running into the buildings as they collapse? Will you be one of the people who, who kills your neighbor for a can of peaches? I don't know. I have control over me and probably very little of that. But that's what I'm going to try to focus on. From the toilet paper shortage, when COVID hit, it's going to be a pandemonium and chaos. Yeah, could be. And again, that wouldn't surprise me. Depending upon where you live and how you spend your days, and this, this, just, this for me is just one further indication that I need to be spending my days living with urgency. I'm rereading Doug Peacock's book, Walking It Off, and he's constantly reminding me that in taking care of the death of his friend Edward Abbey, he was being reminded to live with urgency. And so that foists that message onto me as well and causes me to contemplate how I'm living in the time we have left. You are not current with Extinction Rebellion and you obviously have not watched Roger Hallam's new film, nor would I. People evolve and so do protests. Please stay current in your field. 
Extinction Rebellion is not my field. These are people who have lied repeatedly throughout their entire existence. And their number one demand of governments is to tell the truth. Really? When have you never ever known a government to tell the truth? Ever. I haven't ever known a government to tell the truth. So if that's your demand, and you continue to lie yourself, as Extinction Rebellion has done since they formed, then I don't have a lot of faith in Extinction Rebellion or anything that looks like Extinction Rebellion. Are there types of investments strategies that benefit and help to remediate climate change? Reforestation, mining reclamation businesses, plant-based foods, solar, wind, geothermal, energy, ETFs, and so on. Let me see. I'm going to take these in order. Investment strategies that benefit and help to remediate climate change? No. Civilization is a heat engine, as I've pointed out a few million times at this point. Reforestation? No. I have a peer-reviewed article on planting trees. You might want to read that. Mining reclamation businesses, civilization is a heat engine. Again, plant-based foods, come on. If anybody's really interested in, and, and I'm, I'm not criticizing a plant-based diet from a personal health perspective, it's a great idea. But in terms of, quote, saving the planet, it's not a good idea. I would encourage you to track down my essay, Single Issue Pursuits, and read that for an overview, now a little bit dated, about how ludicrous plant-based foods will be with respect to, quote, saving us from abrupt irreversible climate change. Solar, wind, geothermal, energy, blah, 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 no, 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 and no. Again, for the 10,000th time, civilization is a heat engine, as demonstrated by at least four peer-reviewed papers by Tim Garrett, atmospheric scientist at the University of Utah, and slowing down civilization heats the planet even faster, based on loss of aerosol masking as little as 20%. So, none of that helps. No more hopium, please. George asks, why do you think the ruling classes aren't taking this information seriously when their own lives and families are at stake? I imagine they are taking it very seriously. Let me repeat myself for about the 3,000th time. There is nothing to be done. At the level of society, there is nothing to be done. If a billionaire wants to pour some money into this, fund the project being headed by Dr. Ye Tao at Harvard's Roland Institute. That's the one Hail Mary pass that might get us out of this. I doubt it, but it might. And people have known about this for a while. I've informed producers who claim to have access to the likes of Bezos and uh, who's the other? The, the Tesla guy? Yeah, Musk. <laughs> they claim to have access to people like Elon Musk and... The guy who owns the Washington Post, whose now I name I can't even remember. Anyway, and they didn't do anything. That ended up with going nowhere. Nobody poured any money into that project. I think it's the only reasonable shot we have. And billionaires could fund this thing with pocket change. Nothing. Absolutely nothing came out of that. Why? Because civilization is a heat engine. And reducing civilized activity, reducing industrial activity heats the planet even faster. I'm not the only person that knows this. Apparently half the people participating in this live stream aren't aware of it, but maybe you are now. But certainly of all the people who would be aware of it, those are the billionaires. They know what's going on. How do you think they came to be billionaires? It's because of their access to information. That's how. So they know, and I don't hear about anybody throwing a billion dollars in the direction of Dr. Ye Tao and his research at the Roland Institute at Harvard. So I think the ruling classes are taking this information seriously. Their lives are at stake. I strongly suspect what they're doing is living with urgency. I strongly suspect that they are sparing no money to complete the adventures they've always wanted to take. They know there's nothing to be done except for a Hail Mary pass here and there. So maybe they're funding those. I don't see any evidence of it, 
but maybe. Thank you very much, Always Curious, for your exceptionally generous donation. In an ideal world, asks Brooklyn Culture Jam, and yes, I know who you are. <laughs> How would you want societies to react to the news of NTHE? In your writing, you said, as the last generation, we could be the best. What would that entail? That would entail decency. That would entail respect for each other, for ourselves. That would, that would entail a lot of love going around. That would entail the best of human behaviors the best. That would entail wearing a mask when you go out in public. That would entail not being concerned about getting the last nickel from your neighbor. So there's a thousand different behaviors that we can talk about. There's a thousand different acts that we each can take on a weekly basis. And many of those acts will make life worse for the people around us and therefore for us. And many of those acts will make the lives better for the people around us. So I would encourage and have encouraged people to do the latter. I don't know what they are, but there are some people who seem to be committed to a life of service no matter the cost. And I have great respect for those people. There are people we all know who are working with homeless people, for example. And there's no particular benefit for them doing that. There's no financial gain from working with people that we commonly call those people because they're different from us. And yet... For some people, that's the only way they can get through the day is by trying to improve the lives of the people around them, or at the very least, trying not to destroy the lives of the people around them, trying not to ruin the day of the people they spend the time with. And so that comes out to a whole lot of different things. And I've written for a long time at great length about this topic and spoken about it now and then. But I think we all know what's the right thing to do in a particular situation. And let's just keep doing the next right thing that emerges before us. I think that's the best we can hope for, the best we can wish for, the best we can be. Yes, Michelle points out that in human terms, talking here about the protein denaturization as it occurs in plants, in human terms, it's like exceeding the basal metabolic rate without consuming food and consuming the body to the point of failure. Yes, that's what plants are forced to do at temperatures higher than optimal for photosynthesis. And that denaturization of the proteins occurs somewhere around 40 degrees Celsius and higher temperature, about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Thank you, Kuro Hikes. Certainly that will be enough for some ice cream. And apparently you know me all too well. Do I think the masking effect impacts will move with the seasons? I think it, it did already this year. There was significant loss of masking over Wuhan and the area around Wuhan where industrial activity was initially decreased. The next place that occurred, and, and, and this is reflected in spikes in temperature in each one of these places as well. The reduction in industrial activity was difficult to measure in some places, so various proxies were used in terms of atmospheric components. But 
first in the area around Wuhan, next in India, next in a relatively large area in Eurasia, ultimately in North America, most notably in the Northeast United States, there were significant declines in industrial activity that corresponded with spikes in temperature. I suspect that one of the outcomes will be significant crop declines this year compared to previous years. And I think we're already seeing that play out in China and we'll see it play out if we can actually get some information in North America as well. So there's this lag between the temperature spike and when we observe the fact the effect through biology and ecological interactions. But I think we're going to see that play out this fall. I will be very happy if I'm wrong about that. And it might be delayed until next year. We've never been here before. So it's a little difficult to say with certainty what's going to happen in the near or mid or distant future. But I think the aerosol masking effect has already moved with the seasons and we were lucky that the initial outbreak of the coronavirus was in late winter because that means that the biological impacts don't play out because plants are already persisting based on last year's carbohydrate reserves. So we're going to see the impacts play out over the course of the next weeks and months. Go. Whew. That was something. Do you think the, the new ocean discovered 400 miles below the Earth's surface could contain life? This is the first I've heard about a new ocean discovered 400 miles below the Earth's surface. But life on Earth originated in the oceans. So if there is an ocean 400 miles below the Earth's surface, I would be surprised if there weren't some forms of life there. I just have never heard anything about it. Thank you, James John, for the donation and the cute little meme. Keep it up. Wow. As long as I can, trust me. S2 Sailing Free, thank you very much for your donation. And I'm sorry to hear about the loss of your child. Um, my partner Pauline is taking the approach that you took, which is as nearly as I can tell to let her children live in ignorant bliss in the time that remains. It hardly seems like all that remains is love. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that. There's a lot of Mm, unlovely people out there and a lot of actions lacking in love. But again, I have control to the extent I have free will over only my own actions. I could criticize all day the people who are acting badly. Many of them used to be very close to me. I suspect we all know people who fit into that category. All we really have the ability to control, and there's some question about how much control we have over that, is us, is ourselves and our own actions. How are you going to behave? What are you going to do? That's it. Thank you, Kevin Gensch, and welcome to Climate Defenders. Thanks for joining as a member. Kevin asks, do you think we will make it at least to 2035? No, absolutely not. I, I believe that the last human on Earth will die sometime in 2025. I think most of us will die before then, and that might be this fall as a result of the crop failures, or might be the fall after that. You know, the, the coronavirus accelerated what was already underway through the loss of aerosol masking, through the loss of global dimming. But... It's not as if it came without warning. I wrote about it more than 13 years ago at Nature Bats Last. 
So when, when we talk about the end being near long enough, at some point the end isn't near, it's here. And I suspect we are very close to that point. And I'm not pleased about that, obviously. My life is going swimmingly. Thank you, Nicey J, for your incredibly generous donation. Andrew Glickson, yes, had us at CO2 equivalent of 560 parts per million. That was at least a year ago. And that was including only a couple of the greenhouse gases as well. And I think we're nearing the end here. We're 15 min minutes beyond the point we said we were going to carry on. I'm trying to find any more questions. Thank you, Back to Earth, for the donation. And I don't see any more questions. Do you see any more questions, Pauline? I don't know which ones you might have missed. I don't think I've missed any. That's my point. <laughs> Let's Do ask them. Tell me what you think you see, Pauline. I'm just asking them right now. Well, in addition to that. Oh, there's a question from Kevin. Is there hope? No. Hope is a bad idea anyway. <laughs> hope is a mistake and a lie. Hope is just a, a re, it's just, why? why? Hope is wishful thinking. And I know I'm the bad person for pointing that out, but look at the definition. Hope doesn't give any hope. Hope is like the, uh, the other biblical associates, faith. <laughs> and what's the other one? Love, Love faith, whatever. Kuro, Kuro has nailed it. My hope is to go down standing up, to be the person I chose to be and meet my end with dignity. I think that's the best any of us can do. Really. And at the level of community, just a couple of days ago, my latest, my latest essay for Weekly Hubris came out on the first of this month. So today's the fourth, the fifth. So four days ago, my latest for Weekly Hubers came out, and it put some details onto the idea of planetary hospice, including answering several of these questions. So if you go to weeklyhubris.com and then scroll down a little bit to my latest post and then read that essay, you'll see some of the ideas I have in mind for implementing planetary hospice at three different levels, the societal level, the community level, and the level that we live every day with our friends and family that we interact with on a regular basis. So I would encourage you to read that and to add in the comments section ideas that I've undoubtedly missed. Um, David Lutz asked a question early on and he's repeated it. Um, he's wondering what are the vital signs that you look for Okay, so the vital signs are pulse. You do that. Oh no, sorry. Everything's a joke. I documented sixty-nine self-reinforcing feedback loops in the frequently updated thirty-one thousand-word essay climate change summary and update that you can find as one of the tabs at guymcpherson.com. So there's a bunch of self-reinforcing feedback loops. I only maintain that essay up until about the middle of 2016. Since then, I documented self-reinforcing feedback loops at the essay Extinction Foretold, Extinction Ignored. It doesn't have its own tab, but if you scroll down at naturebetslast at guymcpherson.com and look on the right-hand side, you'll find that essay, Extinction Foretold, Extinction Ignored. And so there's a few more self-reinforcing feedback loops there. These are the ones that have already been triggered. They're already underway. They're already documented in the scientific literature 
as having been started. I'm reminded of something Homer wrote in the Iliad some 2,800 years ago. Any moment might be our last. Any moment might be our last. And he was writing that following the paragraph before he'd written that the gods envy us. Wait, what? Any moment might be our last. That's why the gods envy us. The gods have to suffer through this whole thing with nothing new, with knowing that they will never die, ever. They have to go through this forever. Any moment might be our last. That encourages us, or at least it encourages me, to live and to live fully and to stop and smell the flowers. Because if any moment might be my last, then by extension, any flower I smell might be my last. So I would encourage each of you to find what you love and to do it and do it well. And stop and smell the flowers along the way. Any moment might be your last, might be our last. What are UFOs according to you? UFOs according to me are unidentified flying objects. I think that's exactly what it means, in fact. I think you mean if there are aliens, what does that mean for us? And aliens, in my mind, are just another form of hope. I, th I think the standard interpretation of Fermi's paradox comes into play here. That is, by the time a civilization becomes sophisticated enough to conduct interstellar space travel, it also becomes sophisticated enough to commit planetary suicide. And so I don't think we're seeing a lot of alien spaceships for just that reason. And I think we don't. We won't in the future for just that reason. And that certainly is what happened to us. At some point in our history, we might have been able to sequester and secure enough energy to put humans into space, to participate in interstellar space travel, and we're beyond that point now. We don't have en enough energy to take on that task, and that's because we have committed planetary suicide. And I suspect we are not the first. Where is Ye Tao? Ye is spelled Y-E, and he's at the Roland Institute at Harvard University. Y-E-T-A-O, two words. Encourage people not to procreate. What's wrong with that? I think that's a great idea. I did it for 21 years in classrooms, had the expected impact. It's very difficult to overcome evolution by natural selection. So I can scream at students all day to not have children. I just tracked down one of my students who I had not been in contact with for years. So I found her on Facebook right before I opted out of all social media. And she was one of the great students. She was an honor student and she did great stuff in my class and she's always paying attention and seemed to understand the idea that we got too many people already. And so I found her three children later. She only had three. And, and, I think that's it. When is the next meeting live? We haven't set a date yet, but it'll be in about a week. I suspect Pauline will put out a survey. Where? On YouTube? On the channel? Okay, so Pauline will put out a survey on this YouTube channel, Nature Bats Last. Pay attention over the course of the next three days. Vote for the best day and time for you. And we'll try to fit that in. It'll be within a week, plus or minus a couple of days. So look for it here. I will announce it on the blog as well, guymcpherson.com. Do you know what people are working 
There, there seems to be con some confusion about reading the Bible here. <laughs> some people say faith, hope, charity, and other people say faith, hope, love. Sure. Other people say faith, hope, whatever. Anyway. But the greatest of these is love. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you think that problems on our planet could be the solution to the Fermi Paradox? I think that we are following the most common interpretation of the Fermi Paradox, which is we became sufficiently sophisticated with respect to tools and gizmos and behavior that we're going to commit planetary suicide rather than participate in interstellar space travel. The Mears Project with Harvard University, Kevin, represents the only viable approach to significantly stabilize or cool the planet. How's it going? Not well. Primarily because there is not a single billionaire who is willing to invest the pocket change necessary to keep the project afloat. That's the first reason. The second reason is that academics tend to be very conservative. So there's not nearly as much urgency associated with that project as I would like. And we'll end right there. Please stay tuned to this channel for future episodes of Ask an Ecologist Anything. That's me, by the way. And so stay tuned. Vote over the course of the next day or two for the best time for you. And hopefully it won't coincide with any of my sleeping hours.